Now, let's take a quick look at Paraview architecture. When you download the Paraview application on your computer, it actually has three components. A data server, which is responsible for data processing and for reading data and writing data to disk. There is a render server that is doing rendering. And then there is the client, which is the GUI application that you're interacting with using your keyboard and mouse. So when you run Paraview on your laptop, all three components are part of the same application. So the data server, the render server, and the client are just inside the Paraview application on your laptop. In principle, it is possible to run uh, the client, the data server, and the render server on three different computers. Usually when you process data remotely, what you do is you run the data server and the render server as a special PV server application in parallel on the cluster or perhaps a big memory server, and then you connect to it from the Paraview client on your laptop. So this way, all data processing, all heavy lifting and rendering will be done on the remote machine, perhaps in parallel using you know, a large number of cores, and then you're interacting with this visualization live through the client. And you have full impression that you're working with data set stored locally and you're doing visualization locally, but in fact, all heavy data processing and rendering is happening remote on a big machine. So here's an example of things you can do locally and things that you have to visualize remotely. So let's say you have a big memory workstation with 48 gigabytes of memory, which is actually more than what an average laptop has today. And on such a workstation, you can still visualize a single precision variable stored on a Cartesian mesh at 2048 cube. So if you have a larger mesh, if you have more variables, if you have, let's say, an unstructured mesh as opposed to a Cartesian mesh, then 48 gigabytes of memory is not enough. So here's an example that I could not visualize on a 48 gigabyte memory workstation. In this case, I have a fluid dynamic simulation of airflow around the wing, and it was done using open form, uh, using an unstructured mesh, uh, roughly 250 million elements. And then a single variable was taking 25 gigabytes on disk because you store not just the variable itself, but also you store the X, Y, Z coordinates of all mesh points and then connections between the mesh points. So this is the unstructured grid. And then visual, to visualize this, to load this into memory on, on a machine, you actually need more than 120 gigabytes of memory. So I could do this successfully uh, on a HPC cluster using 64 cores in parallel. And the total memory uh, was 128 gigabytes. Uh, let's start Paraview on our laptop. Uh, depending on your operating system, you would probably go to the Applications folder or to the Start menu and then find Paraview there. Or perhaps if you have a terminal, you can type Paraview and hit Enter. So you will start it in different ways depending on your operating system. And then the interface you get is similar to this one. So on uh, in the top left corner, you will see uh, the pipeline browser, which will contain different objects. When you create a VTK object or when you read a data set, that data set will appear at the top. And then you can click on this data set and then see its various properties in the bottom, uh, bottom left panel. And then you can also click on the information tab to get more information about the data set. And then your visualization will be shown on the right. So let me actually switch to the Paraview program running on my laptop. Here it is. So I'm starting from scratch. I don't have any data loaded. Let's go to the sources menu, alphabetical. And then let's choose a three-dimensional object, for example, a cone or a cylinder or a sphere or a box. I'm going to choose a cone. And then nothing happened. You see that cone appeared in the pipeline browser, but it's not visualized yet because I need to hit on apply. I do that. And now I have a three-dimensional cone that I can actually spin around using the left mouse button. The scroll will, will let me zoom in and out. And then the right mouse button will actually let me pan in the plane of the screen. Uh, when I click on the cone, these are the properties of the cone. I can modify them. For example, resolution refers to the number of points at the bottom of the cone. I can set it to a high number, let's say 30. And then I click apply. And now I have a higher resolution cone. Uh, radius, let's modify it, uh, change it from 0.5 to, let's say, 0.3. I hit apply. Now I get a slightly smaller cone and so on. This object is loaded into memory, and then you can get more information about this object by clicking on the information panel. 
And you can see how many points there are, how many cells there are, how much memory it uses, etc., etc. So let me click on sources, alphabetical, and then I'll bring up another object, let's say a sphere. I click on apply. So now you see that the cone and the sphere are right on top of each other. So I'm going to modify the center of the sphere. Uh, let's pay attention to the orientation to the triad here. You can see that the cone is parallel to the x-axis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift the center of the sphere in the positive x direction, let's say by one. And then I'm going to hit apply. And uh, as you can see now, you have the sphere sitting right on top of the cone. I'm going to use one of these buttons to set the uh, one of the predefined orientations. So for example, something like this. OK. And now I'm going to go into the properties of sphere. So click on sphere in the pipeline browser. And then let's set somewhat high resolution. So theta resolution, I'm going to do 50. And then phi resolution is also going to be 50 so that now I have a high resolution sphere in my visualization window. Uh, let me click on cone and then let me click on edit color map. And then because I'm not visualizing any variable here, all I can do is just pick up a color using one of these interfaces. For example, I'll pick yellow color, click OK. Now my cone is yellow. I will click on sphere, edit color map. And then uh, let's make it uh, blue. So here are two very important drop down menus. Uh, the first one lets you choose a variable by which you want to color your data set. Because right now we don't have any variables. We're not actually loading a real data set. It's just a predefined, uh, we have two predefined VDK objects. We don't have a list of variables here. Uh, when you click on surface, uh, you can switch to a different representation. Right now we're looking at the outer surface of the sphere. Let's switch to a wireframe. So now we have a wireframe for the sphere. Let's switch to points. Now you see, you can hardly see them because they're very small, but you can see the points representing the sphere. Let me switch to surface with edges, which is a view that shows both the outer surface and the wireframe. And then you can do the same for cone as well. So for example, if I click on cone, I can uh, visualize it using just the uh, wireframe. So here we go. So now I have these objects loaded into memory. Let's split the view. Uh, let's split the view right here horizontally. And then I click here on render view. And then on the left, I'm going to resize my objects so that they fit nicely like that. Then I click on the right panel and the objects are not visible. And you can actually see that there is an eyeball icon next to each object. So I'm going to make them visible. I'll uh, make the cone visible and the sphere visible. So now you see both of them and you see that the left view and the right view are not connected because I can spin them separately. To connect the two views, uh, you can right click on any view and select click link camera, then click on the other view. And that will uh, link the two views. So they're now exactly the same. If I spin the object, if I zoom and unzoom, you see the views are exactly the same. So uh, to unlink the views, all, what I need to do is go to Tools and then Manage Links, click on the link, and then remove it. And now the two views are independent. So you can further split this. If you have a large screen, you can split this. Let's say you can split this guy vertically and then look at something here and so on. So and then representations, colors, uh, orientations are unique to each each pane. So to close the use, or what I can do is simply click on these buttons, close, and then here. And then uh, if you want to delete data sets, you can click on a data set and then say delete. A faster way to clear everything and start from scratch in Paraview is click on this button. This has disconnect from the server. So it will disconnect the application from the internal Paraview server, will restart the, the server, and then it will start from scratch. So if you click on it, it will ask you to confirm. I'll say yes. And then I start from scratch. You may want to try to reproduce uh, this image. 
So here I have several objects loaded. I have a cone, a sphere, a cylinder, and a box. And then I split my view horizontally and vertically in such a way that I have multiple views. And then I see different objects in different views and they're colored in different ways as well.